What is up, you guys? Welcome to Controversial Thoughts. This is my weekly solo podcast where I get some time to talk about whatever is germane, whatever's on my mind, uh, and whatever I think you guys might be most interested in hearing about. I released a video this week of how I eat in a day in 2021. We did a filming here in Costa Rica of my normal diet. And though this hasn't changed much in the last, I would say, year and a half or so, there have been changes over the last three years that many will know about, but I just want to bring everybody up to speed on what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And in that context, I thought it would be interesting to do a video about my concerns with long-term ketosis and ketogenic diets in humans. And I know this will seem uh, like apostasy to many, but bear with me. I will begin with my personal experience. I will share my clinical experience and some of my own blood work. And then I will get into some of the literature which supports these concerns with long-term ketosis. Before I dive in, I wanna just define what a ketogenic diet is. It's a very low carbohydrate diet. There's a lot of different terms out there right now, low carb, very low carb. I think of a generally a ketogenic diet as less than 50 grams of carbohydrates a day, usually less than 20 grams of carbohydrates per day. This is in stark distinction to what may be considered a low carbohydrate diet, which can be defined a lot of different ways, but most precisely perhaps is less than 40% of your calories from carbohydrates. So as many of you know, if you watch the video about how I eat now, I do include fruit and honey in my diet, and I still eat a very low carbohydrate, excuse me, I still eat a low carbohydrate diet according to the traditional definition because much fewer than 40% of my calories are coming from carbohydrates. I thought it might be useful to give you guys a breakdown of my macros at the beginning of this video. I don't generally think about this, but I eat about the same thing every day. So I, you know, retrospectively did a back of the envelope calculation to give you guys a sense of my macros. And it, it generally comes out to about the same uh, numbers all the time. This is what I trend toward. You may be a little different, but I do think this is a pattern that works well for a lot of humans. So as you know, I start with protein. I get one gram per pound of body weight, sometimes a little more of grass-fed, grass-finished beef, beef that's moderately fatty, either 20% ground beef or ribeye steaks. So I'm getting 20% of my calories there. Uh, at least the, the beef is 20% fat, which doesn't lead to 20% calories as we'll see. Um, but I do like fatty meat. And in that fatty meat, I'm getting about 200 grams of protein per day, which is 800 calories, four calories per gram of protein. I will eat probably around 150 grams of carbohydrates a day. Multiply that by four, you get 600 calories uh, of carbohydrates or so. And then I will probably eat about 150 plus grams of fat per day. Multiply that by nine, you get 1,350 gram, uh, calories from carbohydrates for a total of around 2,750 calories a day. Seems reasonable for me. I think I probably do eat between 2,750 and 3,000 calories a day. And if you break down the macros, it's about 20% uh, carbohydrates and it's about 50% calories by fat and about 30% calories by protein. This is basically the exact macronutrient breakdown you'll see on the animal-based infographic, which you can get by emailing us at radicalhealth at hardensoil.co. We'll send it to you for free. The team there will also help you out with any of your animal-based questions. But this is a breakdown that works well for me. I don't get crazy about it, but that's about where my macros end up. If I have a huge day of surfing or something, I might eat more calories, I might eat more carbohydrates, I might eat more fat, et cetera. But those are generally the macros that I'm eating these days. Now, that's low carb, right? Because I'm less than 40% of my calories from carbohydrates, technically speaking. I actually don't know how anyone could get 40% of their calories from carbohydrates unless you were eating foods that I don't consider to be that great for humans, grains predominantly. And you would have to eat so many grains that you would be excluding protein sources that I find valuable. This would be meat and organs for for, you know, for humans. So I think that if you're starting with one gram of protein per pound of body weight, and that can include some organs as well, you'll see in the, how I eat in a day in Costa Rica video that I do eat raw heart in the morning. I had raw testicle, I'll have raw liver. If I don't have the raw stuff, 
Um, or if I don't have the organs that I'm specifically looking for, I always add our stuff from heart and soil supplements, the desiccated organ supplements, which I'm a huge fan of, obviously. So what you'll find is I'm low carb, but I'm nowhere near ketogenic at 150, sometimes 175 grams of carbohydrates a day. So let's just start off with those definitions and hopefully that sense of my macros will be helpful for you guys. But I do think that 2,700 to 3,000 calories a day is pretty reasonable for me. I'm 5'10", 170 pounds in terms of what I'm eating and how I'm breaking it down. Now, my history, why did I stop doing a ketogenic diet? Well, many of you know that about three years ago, I started on a carnivore diet. I eliminated all plant foods from my diet. That was all fruit even, but certainly all vegetables, all leaves, all stems, all roots, all nuts, seeds, grains, and legumes, which are all seeds. And I did that as an experiment originally, found psychological benefits. I felt much calmer mentally, much more emotionally stable. My eczema got way better. And I felt great for about a year. And then I really began to notice that I was having some pretty severe muscle cramps. And I began to notice that I was having some pretty severe heart palpitations at night. And I was having some sleep disturbance. And I generally if I really was honest about it, sometimes felt a little cold and had trouble getting warm. And when I started to do my labs, some things started to change in a negative way. Specifically, my total T3, which is triiodothyronine, the active form of your thyroid hormone, was dropping. And my testosterone was dropping a little bit. And I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it because I felt okay. But eventually, after about a year and a half on a strict carnivore diet of meat, organs, and fat, I had to admit that I probably didn't feel as good as I wanted to. I really couldn't rock climb anymore because I would get bad cramps. I would wake up with cramps in the morning and my, my muscles, my sleep was getting a little bit funky. I didn't really feel like I slept great. And this was in the midst of really finding so many benefits to eliminating the vegetables that I was having trouble wrapping my head around this because like so many of us, it's easy to get dogmatic and religious about food. I'm guilty of this too. So what did I do? I took a breath or maybe five. And I re-examined where I was coming from with this. And I thought, okay, if I'm going to eat plant foods, if I'm going to re-include carbohydrates in my diet as an experiment, because I did not want to be dogmatic. I really wanted to be honest about this. And I wanted to feel good. I knew, or I believed that I knew that excluding vegetables was a good thing, that I hadn't really had negative effects from not eating kale or broccoli. But I kind of had a sense that maybe including carbohydrates would be beneficial for me. Again, so I started with honey. And of course, there was a lot of dissonance in my mind. I've done multiple controversial thoughts videos on honey and why I include it and the benefits of honey that I won't really go down that rabbit hole too much today. But let's just suffice it to say that honey is incorrectly vilified. I don't think sugar, even simple sugars found in a food matrix, especially like honey, are harmful to humans. You can go back and listen to the other videos about honey if you have questions about that. Immediately when I included honey, I felt better, significantly better. The cramping in my legs took a little while to resolve, probably weeks, maybe even a few months, but the palpitation stopped, the sleep got better, and I immediately felt like my muscles were a little more full and I wasn't cold all the time. So when I look back at my labs, all of this kind of makes sense and I can see it reflected in the transition. Those of you watching this will notice that the lights came on because the sun is setting in Costa Rica. Regardless, let's take a look at my labs. So in July of 2019, uh, you can see on my blood work here that my TSH was 1.49 and my total T3 was 55. My free T4 was at the low end of normal. Um, and my total T4 was also kind of at the low end of normal. My reverse T3 was 15. And looking at my other labs, you can see my FSH and my LH were okay, but my free testosterone was 4.64, which is a little on the low side. And my total testosterone was 562, kind of on the low side. And then I want to point out my sex hormone binding globulin of 113. So my SHBG was quite high throughout all of the time that I was in ketosis. So that was when I was fully carnivorous. Now, if you compare that to labs one year later in July of 2020, you can see my sex hormone binding globulin with the inclusion of carbohydrates is now 59. <laughs> 59. So it's essentially half of what it was. I'll talk about that a little bit, but I do think that there is good clinical and research evidence that ketogenic diets long-term elevate SHBG, which leads to a lower free testosterone. 
you'll see that my total testosterone is now 742 or was in July of 2020. Um, it remains there 700 to 800. And my free testosterone was 64 in July of 2020. All of these improved significantly with inclusion of carbohydrates in my diet. I will also point out for those of you who are interested that my fasting insulin was three when I was zero carb, quote unquote, as a carnivore and remained less than three, essentially undetectable, uh, less than three micro IU per ml with the inclusion of significant amounts of honey in my diet for many months when checked in July of 2020. My C peptide was actually lower with carbohydrates. So lest anyone believe that the inclusion of these carbohydrates in my diet was making me insulin resistant, uh, there's a lot of literature and my own labs arguing strongly against that notion. I'll show you the thyroid stuff from the July labs. TSH is down significantly. That is thyroid stimulating hormone. I'll comment on that. T4 free is about the same. Uh, T3 free was unfortunately not measured in the other labs, but is now within the reference range and is fine. And subjectively, with the inclusion of carbohydrates, like I said, I felt much better in terms of body temperature as an indication of overall basal metabolic rate, perhaps. Now, for those who are not aware of thyroid hormone physiology, TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. And when TSH is higher, it means that the brain, specifically the pituitary gland, is having to work harder to stimulate the thyroid to make the thyroid hormones, T4 and T3 subsequently, that it needs to fuel metabolism in the human body. So higher TSH generally means uh, more work uh, or more of a press down on the gas pedal coming from the brain to the thyroid gland. So what we see is that with the inclusion of carbohydrates, my brain has to work less hard to get my thyroid to make the thyroid hormones that it needs. And uh, both subjectively and objectively, the thyroid hormone status appears to be improved with the inclusion of carbohydrates in my diet. As I mentioned earlier, muscle cramping, palpitations, sleep, <laughs> all got significantly better as well. And as I noted with the insulin, there was no real downside. And I've talked about this on multiple videos previously as well. When I started including carbohydrates back in my diet, one and a half, almost two years ago, I went even further and did multiple continuous glucose monitors with NutriSense. I had Kara from NutriSense on the podcast. You can listen to that one. I'm gonna show you guys some of the continuous glucose monitors that I wore while including carbohydrates in my diet and make some comments about those. Kara is coming back on my podcast soon. We're gonna do a part two about continuous glucose monitors. I think they're super beneficial and can help triangulate all of this information about metabolic health. But if anyone is concerned about what their CGM might look like with honey, you can see this was mine on, uh, this would have been May the 12th, uh, 2020. And this is two inclusions of honey in my diet in the day. These are, peaks, they're spikes, but what you want to look at here is not the absolute peak here number. In fact, glycemic index and glycemic load have repeatedly failed to be associated with significant health outcomes. I'll show you guys a study that uh, corroborates that assertion. I don't worry about the absolute peak of my glucose postprandially after eating. What I worry about is how quickly it returns to normal baseline. As you can see in this continuous glucose monitor on this day, my baseline was around 80 or perhaps even lower uh, milligrams per deciliter of glucose. These are my two meals. They both were about the same. I think they were probably steak, eggs, and some honey and some organs. And you can see the insulin, well, this is a glucose, but the insulin is gonna correspond here. So the glucose goes up and it comes right back down. Glucose goes up and it comes right back down. The area under this curve you can integrate this curve is very, very small, which indicates continued insulin sensitivity despite the inclusion of carbohydrates in my diet. Again, there is no downside here, guys. Do not fear carbohydrates in the food matrix. Now, I'd like you to contrast that with the CGM of someone who is insulin resistant or has issues with their postprandial glucose levels. You can see this is actually a CGM from someone eating junk food, baked beer, battered fish, and coleslaw. And you can see that their blood sugar uh, later into the day after they ate these things for dinner is much wider with multiple peaks and does not return to normal. So what you wanna look at here is the baseline and the absolute, but also the area under the curve. Look at the difference between this area under the curve 
and the area under the curve that I showed you on mine. I also want to show you guys uh, another CGM that's a little concerning. And this one is from someone who probably believes they are healthy because this is a vegan's um, CGM uh, reading. But as we can see, this vegan is having a significant elevation of their glucose uh, in the middle of the night with multiple peaks, multiple peaks and a huge area under the curve. This is not insulin sensitivity. This is why continuous glucose monitors can be so helpful. So you can see the great difference between mine, including carbohydrates in my diet and people who are metabolically unhealthy. Now, we wouldn't expect me to be metabolically unhealthy with a fasting insulin less than three, which is why I believe that test is so important for humans. The last thing I want to share is one of the concerns that I have with long-term ketosis. This is from someone who is long-term ketogenic. You can see their breakfast was three eggs, two pieces of uh, bacon. And though this appears flat, if you look at the baseline, their baseline uh, blood sugar is between 110 and 120. My baseline was between 70 and 80. This is what happens with long-term ketosis in the blood sugars. This is called persistent physiologic insulin resistance. This is an adaptive response that we don't fully understand. And I just don't think it's going to be good for humans to have that level of fasting blood sugar and postprandial blood sugar all day long. When I've done my hemoglobin A1C, it's 4.7 or so, suggesting an average blood glucose 85, something like that. Uh, hemoglobin A1C is an average over the last 90 days of your glucose throughout the day. This person's uh, hemoglobin A1C is probably high fives or even six, suggesting that their average blood sugar is 110, 115 all the time. They may not be spiking it, but um, it doesn't ever go down and their baseline is very high. This is what happens when we are in ketosis. The body releases more free fatty acids. If you look back at my labs from uh, when I was a strict carnivore, my free fatty acids in my blood were slightly elevated because I was in ketosis. You can see that here. Free fatty acids, 0 0.60 millimole per liter. Kind of elevated. That's what happens when you're in ketosis. That is a normal reaction by the body to increase free fatty acids in the blood. And that is a signal to the peripheral tissues to refuse insulin, specifically the muscles, uh, to, excuse me, to refuse glucose, to refuse the actions of insulin, and then to refuse glucose in order to spare glucose for tissues that rely on it, red blood cells, brain, et cetera, adrenals. So free fatty acids are intimately connected with insulin resistance, both physiologic and pathologic. And I've done videos distinguishing between those. In case any of you guys are curious, people always say, as an aside, do you get enough vitamin E on a carnivore diet? Yes. Tons of vitamin E. My vitamin E was quite high when I was eating a carnivore diet. There's lots of vitamin E in fat, something that mainstream nutritional pundits often forget. So carnivore diet, adequate vitamin E, not great in terms of long-term ketosis. I wanna dive into some of the literature supporting these concerns, but in summary, my concerns are these with long-term ketosis. Electrolyte abnormalities due to inadequate effects of insulin on the kidney. Insulin often gets vilified. Insulin is a necessary hormone for humans. Do not fear insulin fear metabolic dysfunction, which is different. And insulin does not cause metabolic dysfunction in and of itself. I've done many podcasts on this. So electrolyte deficiency leading to muscle cramps, palpitations, many of the things due to inadequate insulin uh, actions on the kidney, which results in salt uh, preservation. I'm going to show you guys literature on that. Thyroid effects, decreased T3, essentially subclinical hypothyroidism, other hormonal effects on testosterone, uh, even further hormonal effects potentially on cortisol and epinephrine, and long-term effects in terms of blood glucose regulation leading to elevated fasting blood sugar, which is probably less than ideal. So before I move into the literature supporting all of those concerns to bookend my clinical experience, my personal experience, which I've shared, I do want to show you guys an interesting study looking at blood glucose, um, the glycemic index and the glycemic load. And the title of the study is Relevance of the Glycemic Index and Glycemic Load for Body Weight, Diabetes, and Cardiovascular Disease. 
And if you read this paper, what you'll find is um, that even for observational studies, the relationship between glycemic index and glycemic load and disease outcomes is limited. The strongest intervention studies typically find little relationship between GI and glycemic load and physiological measures of disease risk. Thus, it is unlikely that the glycemic index of a food or diet is linked to disease risk or health outcomes. Other measures of dietary quality, they say such as fiber or whole grains, I disagree with that, may be more likely to predict health outcomes. What is so interesting for me and striking about the study is the point that I was making about absolute blood glucose apex. It doesn't matter. What matters is the area under the curve and the area under the curve of your blood sugar readings on a continuous glucose monitor is an indication of your metabolic health. Who cares if your blood sugar goes to 150? Don't worry. If it comes right back down quickly and you have a small area under the curve, you remain metabolically healthy. Your fasting insulin is usually quite low and it's fine. It's fine. The Hadza didn't worry about this. I don't worry about this. You shouldn't worry about this. I take significant issue with people who say, keep your blood sugar below 120 or your blood sugar below 140 all the time. I think it's a misunderstanding, a lack of understanding of the way that the blood sugar system works in the human body. There's no problem with high blood sugars temporarily. What matters more is the pattern, the way your body manages the blood sugar. It's okay to eat a few tablespoons of honey. It's okay to eat some strawberries or a mango or papaya. When I was with a Hadza and we got a hive of honey, they went hard on that hive of honey. Their blood sugar definitely went to 150, as did mine. And I don't think there's any problem with that. So let's look at some other studies uh, corroborating my concerns with ketogenic diets. Actually, before we jump into that, I'll show one more study because I love to defend honey and how beautiful it is. The effects of natural honey consumption in diabetic patients, an eight-week randomized clinical trial, 48 diabetic subjects randomly assigned to two groups, Honey group received oral natural honey for eight weeks. Weeks Control group did not. After adjustment for baseline values, there were no significant differences in the fasting blood sugars between the two groups. Body weight, total cholesterol, LDL, and triglyceride decreased, and high-density lipoprotein increased significantly in the honey group. Uh, this is a pretty significant indicator of improved metabolic health in the honey group. Now, what would you expect in someone who's diabetic eating sugar? Yeah, their blood sugar went up, but their fasting blood sugar didn't go up. So they're metabolically improved. They're gonna get a blood sugar spike from this honey, which may not be the best thing, but does it really matter if their overall metabolic health is improving with a food that many would call pure sugar? I don't think so. I don't think that there's better ways to treat people who are diabetic. And the main thing these people need to do is get the seed oils out of their diet, but that's a good one for honey. I talked a lot about concerns regarding ketogenic diets and electrolyte maintenance. And clinically, professionally, personally, what I've seen is that no level of electrolyte replacement will abolish, will ameliorate the electrolyte deficiencies that happen with ketogenic diets long-term. No level. You can eat all the salt, all the magnesium, and all the potassium you want. The latter two may be actually dangerous if you eat too much, especially potassium, and not see an improvement in your electrolyte status. And that is because of this phenomenon, which is very poorly understood by people. Insulin's impact on renal sodium transport and blood pressure in health, obesity, and diabetes. Insulin has been shown to have anti-natriuretic actions in humans and animal models. That means insulin is connected with the preservation, the conservation of sodium in humans. That's a good thing. You want sodium in your body. In this review, we represent, we present the current state of understanding with regard to the regulation of the major renal sodium transporters by insulin in the kidney. Several groups using primarily cell, cult cell culture have demonstrated that insulin can directly increase the activity of epithelial sodium channel, the sodium phosphate transporter, and the sodium hydrogen exchange type three, and the sodium potassium ATPase. Sodium electrolytes are conserved when you have insulin in response to food. If you are only eating protein and fat, your insulin response is going to be much lower. Many people think this is good. I think it's bad. You're not going to hold on to the electrolytes you need. Excess insulin from carbohydrates is not what causes metabolic dysfunction. I did a whole podcast with Ben Bickman about this. We had a friendly debate. 
I do not believe that insulin induced insulin resistance is the main form of metabolic dysfunction in humans at all, really ever in humans. No one is eating Cheetos 24 hours a day. No one is on an IV of glucose all day long. That is implausible. That is not the main issue. You do not get diabetes by eating too many carbohydrates. And in fact, diabetes, though it is a high blood sugar, is not the blood sugar that you are eating. The sugar in your blood is not what you are eating. It is from excess inappropriate gluconeogenesis, the formation of new blood sugar, of sugar, in your liver in response to a liver that is now insulin resistant because one of the actions of insulin at the level of the liver is to shut off gluconeogenesis. So the whole paradigm is backwards. Limiting carbohydrates can be helpful for people who have diabetes because the glucose handling is so disturbed because of the metabolic dysfunction, but it's a temporary fix and it's not the root cause of the problem and it didn't cause the problem, guys. Ooh, more thunder in Costa Rica. When you limit insulin, when you don't give your body an insulin signal because you're not eating carbohydrates, you will develop electrolyte issues. And no amount of electrolytes will be able to fix that because you are messing with your physiology in an unnatural way and your body wants carbohydrates. But Paul, how can I eat carbohydrates? This is why I tried to create a framework for an animal-based diet. And the least toxic carbohydrates are things like fruit and honey, et cetera. Again, you can email us Radical health at hardensoil.co if you have questions about any of that. So let's quickly go through some of the other studies um, talking about further concerns with ketogenic diets. We can go to thyroid. There's a number of studies that have looked at this. Isocaloric, equal calories, carbohydrate deprivation, induces protein catabolism despite a low T3 syndrome in healthy men. What you'll find in this trial is that they put people on three diets. 15% protein and 85-44 or 2% carbohydrates. In contrast to the high and intermediate carbohydrate diet, a low carbohydrate diet decreased plasma T3 values. Ketogenic diets will lower your T3. It will lower a critical thyroid hormone in your body. This is not a good thing, guys. Changes of thyroid hormonal status in patients receiving ketogenic diet due to intractable epilepsy. Hypothyroidism was diagnosed. <laughs> L-thyroxine was initiated for eight, seven, and five patients at one, three, and six months of ketogenic diet, respectively. This is what happens when you go into ketosis. It's going to lower your T3. It's a concern. I don't think it's an ideal state for humans. I don't think you need to be in ketosis. The effect of diets high in protein or carbohydrate on inflammatory markers in overweight subjects. This is an interesting study that points out that it doesn't matter what your carbohydrate to protein ratio is, carbohydrates are not inflammatory. <laughs> Dietary carbohydrate to protein ratio has no effect on inflammatory markers. Body fatness, which is metabolic dysfunction, is positively associated with serum CRP. We need to stop conflating carbohydrates with inflammation, with obesity, and with metabolic dysfunction. We talked about this one, the relevance of the glycemic index and the GL, the glycemic load, uh, there's basically no relevance. And if you had questions about this, this is a really, really interesting paper showing that adipocyte dysfunction linking obesity to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, this is the free fatty acids that I was talking about. Fat cells get overly full. They spew out fat molecules. I've talked about this in the past. Those fat molecules break insulin signaling and glucose handling and the rest of the body. This is metabolic dysfunction. Well, when you're ketogenic, you're going to induce a state like that, not in the same way that polyunsaturated fatty acids do, and thankfully quickly reversible. Polyunsaturated fatty acid induced metabolic dysfunction is much more difficult to correct, takes a longer time. Ketogenic diet induced physiologic insulin resistance is much faster to correct, but it does induce physiologic insulin resistance, which will lead to high levels of baseline glucose, like I showed you. Insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance are altered by maintenance on a ketogenic diet, Exactly the same thing that I told you guys before. Effect of 20 days on the, of the ketogenic diet on metabolic and respiratory parameters in healthy subjects. The takeaway from this study, if you read the abstract or the study, is that when you have a ketogenic diet, you produce less carbon dioxide. Though that may sound like a good thing, uh, there's lots of evidence that producing more carbon dioxide is better for your metabolism, helps vitamins like vitamin K2 work better, et cetera. So ketogenic diet will be 
detrimental in that respect as well, in my opinion. Now, on to the meat of the matter. Influence of dietary carbohydrate intake on the free testosterone to cortisol ratio responses to short-term intensity uh, exercise training. I love this idea of a free testosterone to cortisol ratio. I think it's something we should use much more for telling when athletes are overreaching and anyone who wants to put photos of themselves on the internet with their shredded bod of 4% body fat needs to also put a free testosterone to cortisol ratio next to it. Because guess what? Many of these people are overreaching and they've so limited their fat, their testosterone's in the toilet, they look good, but there is no go, there's no mojo within that shell of a body. What they found was that when people had more carbohydrates, this ratio was better. Subjects um, found, so statistical analysis revealed that the free testosterone to cortisol ratio decreased significantly from pre-study resting measurements to the final pro-study resting measurement in the low carbohydrate group, but no change occurred in the control group. Testosterone, dropping on a low carbohydrate diet. Modification of immune responses to exercise by carbohydrates, glutamine, and antioxidant supplements. The takeaway from this one is that higher carbohydrate diets are better for immune responses. It's all connected. Diet hormone interactions, protein to carbohydrate ratio alters reciprocally the level of plasma, testosterone, and cortisol, and their respective binding globulins in man. This is a little bit like what I talked about. I clinically have observed this over and over and over. SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, goes way up on a ketogenic diet. Free testosterone goes down. Cortisol, up. This is what happens on long-term ketosis, guys. Now, this is not to say that you cannot get increases in testosterone when a ketogenic diet is used in people who are sick, who are diabetic. So we have to decide what is the context we are looking at this diet in. Are you a diabetic person, maybe a ketogenic diet is useful in the short term. Long term, be aware that if you're getting electrolyte issues, palpitations, your body has what is probably unremediable electrolyte issues and you need to add some carbohydrates back. But in this study, they did find that a ketogenic diet improved testosterone, but these are people who are very sick and likely had metabolic dysfunction, which was limiting their testosterone. I'm telling you that if you are a healthy individual and you do a long-term ketogenic diet, you will see your testosterone go down. Testosterone and cortisol in relationship to dietary nutrients and resistance exercise, same uh, takeaway from this one, uh, carbohydrates, beneficial. And when you look in here more, this study by uh, Volek actually showed that polyunsaturated fatty acids lowered testosterone. That's a key thing that I always like to talk about, guys. You know that um, polyunsaturated fatty acids are no friend of yours. Bruising in the ketogenic diet, evidence for diet-induced changes in platelet function. Uh, maybe a long-term ketogenic diet isn't great for platelets either. And last but not least, uh, this is a great review by uh, Laguerre looking at glucocorticoid feedback, meaning stress hormones going up when carbohydrates are limited. This has been documented many times and does seem to be the case. So there just are so many downsides to a long-term ketogenic diet that I have concerns about it. It's important to talk about it. It's important to put aside our dogmatic beliefs. It's important to say, you know what? I believed something at one time. I experimented with it. I learned and I've changed my mind. If you guys are listening to nutritional advice from people who never changed their mind, then do you really believe they're right 100% of the time? I'm never gonna be right 100% of the time. But what I try to do always with my efforts, all of these projects, is to be honest, to admit when there were things that I wasn't fully understanding and to move forward so that we can all journey on this together and be as good as possible together and we learn along the way. Does it mean that everything I've tried over the last few years is invalid? No, absolutely not. I definitely still am not a fan of vegetables. I'm definitely still not a fan of seeds, nuts, grains, and legumes. I definitely don't think you need seed oils in your diet, but I don't fear fructose and I don't fear sugar in the food matrix. And I do not think that long-term ketosis is beneficial for humans because of all the reasons that I enumerated today. And while we're on the topic of polyunsaturated fatty acids, I'll just share one more study that was interesting to me, looking at competitive inhibition of T3 binding to receptors by certain fatty acids. If you read this study, what you'll find is that polyunsaturated fatty acids may also have a mechanism 
of interfering with triiodothyronine, that is T3, at the level of the thyroid receptor. So a little bit off topic there, but the takeaway from this video is ketogenic diets may be beneficial for some people, kids with intractable epilepsy, people with end-stage Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. If your mitochondria are already broken, a ketogenic diet might be beneficial. If you are a healthy individual, long-term ketosis is likely to come with many problems. Don't be dogmatic. Be willing to include fruit and carbohydrates in your diet, fruit and honey. If you're fearful of those things, watch the other videos I've done about why you shouldn't fear those things. Look at hunter-gatherer groups like the Hadza. Check your fasting insulin. Check a continuous glucose monitor from a company like Nutrisense. Know what you're working with and thrive. I can't tell you how often I get emails from people at Heart and Soil saying, I'm getting muscle cramps. I'm getting palpitations. I'm doing a carnivore diet. What am I doing wrong? The response is eat some freaking carbohydrates. And they always come back and say, I feel so much better. Thank you. Moving outside of our dogma allows so much freedom. I want to wrap up by reading a review from somebody that sent me this at Heart and Soil. This is from Jennifer H. She's taking bone marrow and liver and the title is renewed. Again, I love the emails you guys send me at Heart and Soil, the emails you send to the team. It helps me make these videos because there's a lot of interesting information there. We see it. I've seen it in my clinical practice. Jennifer H. says, I started taking these supplements. I didn't notice a change until I ran out and was out for a week while they were shipping. The mood balance and workout enhancement when I got them back were off the charts. I'm a 38-year-old female, physically fit. I eat a paleo diet, but these put me on a different level. I have always struggled with hormone balance, but didn't want meds. These supplements have been my answer. I am now on a recurring order, so I won't run out. Again, that's Jennifer with bone marrow and liver. So hopefully this video has been helpful. If it brings up more questions, I'm happy to go into more detail. Don't be dogmatic. Results over dogma. Reclaim your birthright to radical health, you guys.